time to look it up, and I was like, why have I not been seeing this all of my life? It turns out Randall has been seeing it all of his life, so he's ready. And I am so excited about this song. Um, and so, uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to keep more singing back there on our toes, so just, just bear with me. But anyway, um, there is a joy here that I can't really say the same thing about. So anyway, we're going to try and start out a little bit, a little bit like a cappella, and we're, we're going to have some fun with this. So uh, thank you for um, introducing me to a song that I should have known.
slave for Christ. He uses that imagery of slavery. So today, the title of this talk is uh, Through the Eyes of a Sports Fan. The Eyes of a Sports Fan. So, what starts this week? The Olympics! Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> yeah, the Olympics. Right. They tell you how much coverage the Olympics have been getting recently. As you know, it's in Rio, uh, and there's been so much controversy that if you've read about that, in regards to the virus and the political turmoil, and the accommodations aren't up to par, supposedly, and so a lot of people aren't excited about it. But the Olympics do start this week, later this week. And uh, how many like following the Olympics? I mean, honestly, you like watching the Olympics? What's your favorite sport you like watching? Gymnastics, gymnastics, swimming. swimming and gymnastics. Now, let me ask you, I hear some participation. I don't do that. <laughs> Why gymnastics and swimming? What's so <coughs> cool about that for you? I understand a little bit about gymnastics. You understand? Right. So, right. Okay. Swimming. You said swimming. You like the diving? I like all of it. You like all of it. Yeah. What, how about you for John? I like the track and the swimming because, you know, they've got their lane and they just give it their all. It's, right. It's just them. Right. Yeah. You know, so, great. So we're all looking forward to the Olympics to some degree, maybe. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting, you know, back when, when Jesus, uh, when he taught, uh, he spoke his parables. We talked about that last week. And he would use, uh, remember the parable of like the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. He would talk about treasure in the field or the lilies of the field. He would talk about treasures in heaven and such. So he, he kind of gave that imagery. <clears throat> uh, but Paul, he, he kind of does the same thing. Uh, but for him, he, he was very relevant to the world in which he lived. And so he also used things that were around him. You know, Jesus would use very much agricultural terms because of where he was at. But Paul, being kind of more of the suburban slash urban uh, cities of the ancient world, uh, he used metaphors that were very much relate, relatable to them, and one of them being the sports. So he knew very well uh, the Colosseum, 
He knew very well that what's known as the, they call it the gymnasium. Now we use the term gym now, but the gymnasium then was a, a much different kind of concept. It was more than just going there to work out. You competed uh, and blood was shed, that, that kind. So he understood that and so he, he would write about that and we see these in some of his letters. And so we're going to, today we're going to look at a couple of those in particular from the his letter to uh, the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. So go ahead and turn there with me. Um, so Paul's a man. He knew about the Olympic Games uh, in, in the gym. It was, this world was a world of sports that he lived in. And the Greeks led the way with the Olympics. The Olympics started a few centuries before the time of Christ. And that's, that's how old they are. And we get the word fan, like sports fan, from the word fanatic. Uh, and so people who, you know, you were called a fanatic for a certain individual, uh, for a sports team necessarily. But you can see where this appetite for excitement, this fanaticism, grew and grew to the point that people wanted more violence in that culture. It wasn't just enough that you ran a race and you, someone won, someone lost, and woo, great. It became more of, no, we need to see some more violence in this. And as we know, it turned into uh, competitions that led to death. You see these in movies such as Gladiator that came out several years ago, and other movies, ben, the remake of Ben-Hur is coming out. Um, and, and so they would use starved animals, you know, people would fight against, you know, starving lions. And, and, and as we know, that when Christians were persecuted, Christians were sent into the Colosseum for their death. Paul knew this world very well. And I kind of imagine that he watched it from, kind of from the sidelines at times. Um, the longest metaphor that we find in Scripture that Paul uses is found in 1 Corinthians 9, chapters, verses 24 through 27. And before I read these, in the, in the city of Corinth, right uh, near Corinth, there was these other games. and what, They weren't the Olympics. The Olympics were over four years. But there was another group of games called the Asthenian Games. And uh, they were held every two years. And these games were not as on a grander scale as the Olympics, but they still had you know, things like javelin and the discus throwing, and they had foot races, and they had wrestling and boxing, um, and things like that. But so when Paul writes, and he's going through this letter, and he's writing to these believers in Corinth, he makes this analogy, starting verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown. But we, and he's talking, remember he's talking to believers, we, Christians here, we do it for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as the one who beats the air. This is interesting. We'll get to this in a few minutes. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, in the Greek races, uh, the, the winner would receive a, a crown that was uh, made of really pine bows and, and it was made of uh, an herb that was similar to parsley and, and uh, celery. Now, that doesn't sound like much, does it? And so they would be given this little crown. You may have seen pictures of this somewhere, maybe a textbook at one, one time. But they would receive this, this crown but what's interesting, of course, with these crowns is by the time this athlete would go home to where they were come from, that crown, what happened to it? It died. Yeah. 
it shriveled up, it withered, it became brown, it probably fell off their head. I mean, who knows? And so, but they, I mean, but think about it. These athletes at this time, they disciplined their body to the extreme condition so that they would receive a piece of parsley. <coughs> glory. They wanted glory. And uh, but Paul says here in these first couple of verses that we've looked at that the crown that what Christians strive for never dies. It's imperishable. See our rewards here on earth are very temporary. And a lot of times we can get so caught up into uh, the awards that we can receive, the promotions that we get, the titles that are beside our name, um, the headlines that we may achieve. And we get so wrapped into that that we feel like we begin to believe that that is what really leads a legacy. And it doesn't. Just because your name is on a building or because you made some awesome business deal or maybe you really did some great work in your community. I mean, that's good things. Paul saying that this is God. They die with you. He's, he's looking at the Christians and he's saying, look, our focus isn't on the things of this world. It's much like what Jesus said when he said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth, that's insects, and rust, corrupt, and thieves breaking into steel, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where none of those things can touch you. Because those things that are in heaven, those things are eternal. We, we, we strive for an eternal reward that is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the crown of righteousness. And so Paul keeps writing. It's interesting. is These athletes at this time, and even athletes now, if you look at the ones that are, are about ready to hit center stage in Rio, they've spent years of their life disciplining their body, right? I mean, and the, the mental exercises they have to do. Uh, a level of self-denial to themselves to achieve what? A form of glory, right? Some kind of medal, maybe. Or maybe it was just to compete in the games. And many athletes just getting there is their greatest achievement. Christians, I wonder if many Christians even have that same kind of self-denial when it comes to the relationship with Jesus? Do they have that comparable kind of dedication and commitment to their own Christian law? I sometimes I wonder if you read this in Corinthians that Paul is somewhat, maybe even somewhat sorrowful. So he's reading, he's writing this, and he's observing in this church, this church was in a that's another sermon for another day. Corinth was a wicked city, and this church was made up of a lot of former wicked people. And um, if he saw in them, hey, you have such much great potential, something you need to live up to. He wanted these Corinthian believers to see their faith in a way, as athletes saw how they committed to participating in these games, with they strive for excellence in everything that they did. Then Paul writes here, and he kind of moves from this racing and, um, metaphor to verse 26 to boxing. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight. Not as one who beats the air. What's that? That's shadow boxing. For those of you who are familiar with boxing. 
But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I should, not, should become disqualified. You know, it wasn't, I can almost envision Paul watching boxers in the ring, in the gymnasium, go at it. And they would punish each other. Or if, if not, they were shadow boxing. So they were boxing what? Their shadow. Or someone else's shadow. And he, and he knew very well that the greatest threat in the Christian life, you know, from an analogy perspective, isn't shadow boxing these fake op opponents. It wasn't false doctrine. It, the greatest opponent was not even hell itself. But he realized his greatest opponent was who? Himself. Wasn't other things? Wasn't other people? He was his greatest enemy. And so what did he have to do? He had to discipline his body, his mind, his soul. Because Paul is saying to us that the battle of the soul is a daily contest that has eternal consequences. And so as he says, I beat, but I don't beat the air, that I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. That's an image there of beating himself. As a boxer beats his opponent, it's as if that same motion, he's beating himself. He's bringing it into self-denial. <coughs> and and it's, a, it's a posture of submission also. But you know, if you think about it, friends, that this is easy to miss when we get caught up in the mundane and routine of life. We get busy. We get uh, uh, focused on other things that are, are important. But yet, we, many times we lose, we lose focus and we're not fixated on the prize that Christ has before us. Again, every day is the battle of the soul and life and it's part of the eternal race. And he sees the, the consequence in here because he, his last phrase here is, I myself should become disqualified. <coughs> he wanted to, um, he wanted to run the race fully without regret. He, needed, he knew he had to persevere. He could quit. What do you mean he was disqualified? There's an urgency and a warning there to all of us that we keep pressing on. So Paul later in his life, and you can go ahead and flip to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy was written, of course, to his to Timothy, his, his uh, mentor, his mentee. Um, we believe that Timothy, these letters were written probably when Paul was at the end of his life. Um, when he was in prison um, in Rome, more likely. But he uses the racing terms again. As he's looking near at his life that's near death. And this is how he wants to sum it up. And this is a challenge. I want you to read it. So we read this together. But this wasn't just for Timothy. This is, of course, for you and I. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. We have verse 8. Say it there. No. No. Reverse D. Um, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. 
and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So let's look at the scripture. As Paul is approaching the end of his life, he once again refers to this race as a metaphor to describe his Christian life. And he uses the phrase, have fought. And this is, does refer, refer to the finality of his death. But Paul is strengthened by the knowledge that he has been a faithful Christian and minister of the gospel to which Christ has called him to. And he uses kind of three figures here. He uses a figure of a soldier, an athlete, and a steward. You look at verse 7 real closely. I have fought the good fight. Soldier. I have kept the faith. You know, uh, excuse me. I have fought the good fight. Soldier. Excuse me. I have finished the race. Athlete. I have kept the faith. In one phrase here, Paul notices the difference between the athletic competitions on earth and the eternal race of which you and I are in. He looks at his reward as also a grand promise to all those who persevere in Christ Jesus. And he says here in verse 8 that there is only one righteous judge. And he alone gives eternal life the crown of righteousness. There are many other people and other judges in this world. There are people who judge athletic competitions. Because he's saying that he's keeping this analogy. There is only one true judge. And he judges our life. And how we've lived for him. Paul uses this sports metaphor to appeal to various groups of whom he knew very well. You look at all these cities that Paul went to, Philippi and Corinth and Ephesus or even Rome. His listeners understood the stadium very well. They got it. They participated. They watched. <laughs> it was trying to hook them to, to make a point, a very great point, of the Christian life. And he respected, Paul respected the dedication of athletes. And he also understood the excitement of the fans that cheered them on just as much as, we, you know, we, we cheer our favorite sports team or, or individual on. He got it. It's okay. I kind of wonder today if Paul's alive. And he was a commentator for the Rio Olympics. What would he say? Maybe he would say something like this. <coughs> she was at her best today. She showed the results of the years of determination, <coughs> training, and self-discipline. And she should be congratulated for her gold medal. Yet, there is more to us than muscle, energy, in coordination. We are eternal creatures made in the image of God. And our biggest race is for an audience of one. And he alone is the judge. That's the challenge that Paul has for you and I this morning as we run the race with perseverance. I'll close with this scripture a scripture that many know well, we've read different times. And the writer of Hebrews, we don't know that it was Paul, but also has this, this same metaphor. Hebrews 12, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Think about that. All the people that have gone on before us, who have run the race. <laughs> let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, 
despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's powerful. We run the race with our eyes on Jesus, who has gone before us. He's already paid the debt. He has given us life. And we run looking at him. It says he's the author and finisher. Started, he's going to end it. We run with endurance. <coughs> and this man, Jesus, God's Son, now sits at his right hand. My friends, we can become so despondent in our lives. And our lives can get so filled with hurt and pain, and we just don't know usually sometimes what to do the next hour of the day. What Paul says to us, kind of of encouragement. He says, look to Jesus. When all else fails, and everything seems hopeless and lost in your life, the truly only person that you can look to is Jesus. And you lean on his everlasting arms. I'll ask John and Brandon to come forward as they lead us in a closing song. May we not just be reminded today of the race and of who Jesus is, but let us put that into action, what that looks like. What's that look like for your own life? What does that look like for us as a church? To run the race. How does Mountain View run the race together? As we look to Jesus for our hope and salvation.
you back tonight for Ecclesiastes study, of course, the secret destination where we get together, we just go and have fun and fellowship, um, get to know each other more as a, as a body. We will read these words one more time as, as we dismiss. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Amen. Amen.